The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome. Happy Father's Day to those to whom it applies. Um, Bread and Roses and, and VBS uh, all this last week, thank you if you volunteered for these things. Um, both went over very well. Uh, we had over 112 kids at VBS this, this last week. Just wonderful. Um, and I, I, I only heard uh, good reports. Some wanted it to go another week. You can rest over the weekend, they told the volunteers. Uh, the church picnic is next weekend at 10 a.m. There's going to be a sheep's head tournament as part of that and games for the kids and the like. Think about bringing your sheep's head friends who don't have a church. Uh, they might enjoy it. Also, um, uh, take a look at hymn 717 it's eternal father strong to save we're going to sing it as a third distribution hymn it's a little confusing in that the first verse is on the left hand side but we're going to sing the old navy hymn version of it and those two verses are on the right hand side above hymn 718 so just when you get there um, uh, please recognize that we're going to sing the navy hymn version of it on on the uh, opposite page that's all I have. Order of service today is Divine set, Service Setting 2, page 167, opening hymn, In Thee is Gladness. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. It's called an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Almighty God, in your mercy, guide the course of this world so that your church may joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its, its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? 
On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold now is the favorable time. Behold now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own afflictions. In return, I speak as to children widen your hearts also. Word of the Lord. Lord. Please stand for the gospel. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him with them they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sermon text is from the Gospel lesson. We're not quite sure what to do with stories like this one. The disciples in a boat, in a storm. Jesus asleep. Jesus ordering the storm to be stilled. Ministers are sometimes asked in a good-natured way, if we can't do something about the weather on a cold, windy, wet Friday evening after the rehearsal, the father of the bride sidles up and says, come on now, Rev, you must have some pole upstairs. Can't you do something about the weather and get us a nice sunny day tomorrow? I pray about the weather now and then, but I also know that God may have bigger issues in mind than this wedding or that golf outing. When on the news, I see a massive low front sweeping up from the south, gathering a lot of steam and energy and momentum and moisture from the Gulf, taking square aim at Wisconsin. Frankly, I'm a little doubtful that my prayers will create a nice little island of warm sunshine around Watertown. Maybe I shouldn't be, but I am. Huge storms don't just stop because we want them to or even because we need them to. Therefore, sometimes we might conclude God must have a hands-off approach. Doesn't like to meddle in human affairs. And so one of my suspicions is that the average Lutheran hears a story like this and at some level simply stops listening. Things like this don't happen. And there's nothing the preacher can say that will make me believe it ever did or will. So we stop listening. We put our mind in neutral and hope the preacher at least keeps it short. It's a big issue, actually. A profound issue about the relationship between the Creator and and His creation. Does God meddle in our lives? Will he intervene for us? And if so, why doesn't he do it more consistently? One theologian sat his students in a circle and put a garbage can in the middle of the circle. These were undergrads. Um, He asked his students to jot down on a piece of paper a story from the Bible that they simply had a hard time believing. And then crumple it up and toss it into the, into the can. And so they did. One wrote down the creation account in Genesis 1, crumpled it up, tossed it in. Another, the possession of demons. Others wrote down various miracles, and on and on it went. It's quite a pile that was growing there. Then the professor took out each item one by one and asked the class to consider this. What truth might we be discarding here? What hopeful, helpful truth about ourselves and about God and the way God interacts with us and the world, what hopeful, helpful truth are we so close to throwing out? By the end, the students retrieved just about everything they had tossed in and if only in their minds, put them reverently back into place. So let's take another look at this passage and ask, how might this ancient text be relevant to us today? What might God be teaching us with this text? Crossing at night had been his idea. His disciples were with him. Earlier he had spent the day teaching by the side of the sea. The crowd that was gathered there was so large that they had to put him in a boat and put it out a few yards so that people could see him and he them. It was an impromptu pulpit. It's night now. He has already dismissed the crowd and is using that same boat, presumably, to cross over to the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Back in 1986, an ancient boat was discovered submerged in the muddy shores of the Sea of Galilee. That was a year that there had been a tremendous drought in Israel, and it shrank the sea and exposed more shoreline, and just the tip of this thing was sticking out of the mud. They excavated, And there's no evidence, of course, that this boat was 
associated with Jesus or his disciples. It does show, however, what a boat from that era might have looked like. They dated it back to 25 BC to 25 AD. And it was a fishing boat. It was a very shallow draft so that it could, a flat bottom, so that it could get close to the shallow waters for fishing. It has a raised stern in back and was open and had low sides along the, along the sides for ease of casting nets and hauling them back in. Think about it. A flat-bottomed small fishing boat with low sides. In a windstorm, such a vessel, it'd be vulnerable, especially to the waves. And that's exactly how Mark describes it. The waves were breaking into the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Realize many in the boat with Jesus are seasoned fishermen. They don't scare easily, but they're scared now. Some are rowing furiously, some are bailing water, some are tugging at the sails, some one is at the tiller, the rudder, and they're all thinking about their wives and their children and how they dearly wish they were at home right now. But they're not at home. They're in a little boat riding low in the water at night in the middle of a great big storm. They think they're going to die. What is Jesus doing? He's in the back, underneath the stern platform, asleep. On a cushion, Mark carefully notes. Matthew, Mark, Luke all report this. It's an essential part of their corporate memory of the event. Certainly his blissful sleep stands in stark contrast with the violence of the storm and the hyperventilating panic of his disciples. The disciples shake Jesus awake and say, Teacher, don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing? It's the language of panic. Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind and addresses the lake as if it were some kind of unruly heckler. Peace. Be quiet. Interestingly enough, he used those same exact words back in chapter 1 of Mark when he's addressing that man in the, in the synagogue in Capernaum, that demon-possessed man. Peace. Be quiet. What has been a great windstorm, Mark described, now has turned into a great calm. It's gone from one extreme to the other. Then Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Clearly, the knowledge and faith of the disciples is still a work in progress. The theme of the, of the disciples' obtuseness will only grow stronger as the Gospel of Mark progresses. They're unable to respond to this crisis with any kind of trust or confidence in Jesus. Instead, they completely lose their poise and they panic. Now that the storm is over, their original fear turns into a new and even greater kind of fear. They realize that they've just brushed up against the almighty power of God. And it scares them half to death. In Mark's gospel, this is the first nature miracle they've witnessed. They've seen him heal the sick and expel demons, but that's fantastic and wonderful and exciting, but people get sick and they get well all the time. The healing proper properties God has given the body are usually sufficient. Sometimes we need a little extra boost from physicians and pharmacists, but we get sick all the time, and most of the time we get well again. What doesn't happen is the dramatic calming of the storm with the utterance of just a few words. This is new. This they haven't seen. By the way, the early Christian church loved this story. In fact, it's one of the, one of the earliest symbols of the Christian church is a small boat being tossed about by the waves in a storm. The early Christians knew what it meant to be in a little boat in a storm. 
Their numbers were small, insignificant, a minority in every city or town. And then they were targeted, hunted down, despised, arrested, tortured, executed by the Roman Empire, the most powerful entity in the world. The early church loved this account of the disciples in the boat and Jesus calming the storm. They heard in this story that they were not alone. For one, they had each other, and that's good. Some of us are rowing, some bailing, some tugging at the sail, and some praying. We can encourage one another, right, and prop one another up, and that helps a lot. I want, wouldn't want to go through this life without you, Christian friends, and I don't think you would want to try to be a Christian out there in isolation. But you know what? There's somebody else in the boat with us. He's back there in the stern, not far from the rudder, actually. Quiet, but present, with all the strength and courage and peace of God in him. And the truth this story communicates is that there's no storm, no threat, no chaos that can undo us or negate us or destroy us because he's there in the boat with us. The truth is that the Lord of the universe, Almighty God, is in the boat and therefore no matter what is going on out there, and there's a lot going on out there, we're ultimately safe in the boat with him. Though all hell break loose, we are secure in his presence and grace. The truth of the story is that each of us, each one of you, has a friend, a companion who stands among us, beside us, encourages and loves and forgives and blesses us and ultimately saves us. Jesus Christ is his name. St. Francis wrote, All my life thou hast been at the helm, though very secretly. Martin Luther wrote, If you want to go abroad with Christ, bad weather will not fail to come, and Christ will want to sleep. Then we will really feel the temptation. Otherwise, if he were not sleeping and were to calm the bad weather too soon, we would never find out what it means to be a Christian. And I suppose would think that we were helping ourselves by our own power. Here, however, temptation strengthens faith. Therefore, one must say, no human power was able to help here. God alone and his dear word have done it. The Sea of Galilee, of course, has no monopoly on sudden and violent storms. We are, each of us, subject to accident, disease, death, We can, without warning, lose love, work, home. Sometimes the storm is violent and life-threatening and we're tossed about, bounced hard on the wood. The noise is deafening. Everything is dark. People are shouting and screaming. And the next big wave is coming and it just might be enough to overturn us. Relax. The one with all the power and love. The one who has claimed you in the waters of holy baptism. He's in the boat with us. And with him we are safe. I like to think about what happened next during the rest of the journey. Mark doesn't tell us. But I, I'll bet they breathed a huge sigh of relief because... They've just been given their lives back. I'll bet they stretched their aching muscles, maybe recounted the most harrowing moments, maybe even laughed a little bit at what an incredible night it had been and how they had all panicked, how they had all thought they were going to die. And as the sun rose in the east and shone on him back there in the stern, I'll bet they stole a glance at him sitting there. Mark says they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the waves obey him? It's Jesus, God's Son, 
God's love from which nothing, no storm, no wind, no wave can separate us. All praise be to him. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, page 174. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayers, we give thanks for successful surgeries to Mike Grosnick and to his wife, for his wife, Shannon Grosnick. Also for a successful surgery for um, um, Jean Stocks. We pray in Thanksgiving for the 59th wedding anniversary of Roberta and Bill Roser. We pray for those in hospice care, including Bill Roser, Robert Rubin, Dorothy Gitzloff. We pray for the Strage family. Bud's funeral was this past week. We pray for those who are deployed. James Rubaki, Kevin Rollert, Zachary Krieger. Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So let us pray to the Lord whom even the wind and the waves obey. For the Christian church here and around the world, that she be preserved from false teachings and divisions, and that she be granted faithful leaders, pastors, and workers who serve joyfully, and that her, num her members gratefully hear God's word and gladly love all the people he places in our lives. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For trust in the midst of troubles, that when the storms of life swirl around us, and the events of life fill us with fear, we confidently rely on our God, knowing that he does care and that we are, even as we are perishing, and live in peace because his mercy never fails. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For forgiveness when we question God's ways, that our Father remind us that he, not we, laid the foundations of the world, and that he humble us and pardon our arrogance, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For faithfulness in receiving God's gifts in worship, that in this summer season, when it is tempting to stray from our Father's house, we remain devoted to hearing our Savior's word and receiving his body and blood, that the Holy Spirit lead back to our fellowship the members of this congregation who are drifting away, and that none of us receive the grace of God in vain. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all fathers for whom we give thanks today, that they cherish God's gift of children, willingly take responsibility for nurturing their families in the knowledge of Christ, and reflect our Heavenly Father's love as they provide for those entrusted to their care. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Robert, Bill, Dorothea, for Jean, Michael, Shannon, and for the Strage family, and for all those who are experiencing life's winds and waves and sickness and sorrow, 
that our Father calm their troubled hearts, carry them through their afflictions and challenges and grief, and grant them his peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have been given positions of authority in our country and state and communities, that God provide them with wisdom for their work, that he lead them to defend the lives of those who are unborn or vulnerable, and that he use them to bring peace, justice, and stability to our neighborhoods and world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For rescue workers who care for us when we endure the storms of life, that our Heavenly Father grant them protection from harm, that he provide strength and diligence to them in their work, and that he spare them from suffering as a result of the traumas they witness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for all who receive the body and blood of Christ, that this life-giving and sin-forgiving food nourish our faith so that we calmly trust God through all the storms of life and eagerly care for others when the waves of trouble threaten them. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who serve in the armed forces, for James, Kevin, and Zachary, that you bless them and keep them and return them home safely to their families. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. If he had not been on our side, the flood would have swept over us. But blessed be the Lord who has rescued us. So into your caring hands, dear Father, we place ourselves and all those for whom we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he is betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
us pray. O God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.